So our keynote speaker today is Louise Guthrie. I've known Louise for many years in the context of joint collaboration on uh, information extraction projects. On DARPA, DARPA projects. Uh, Louise has a background in uh, mathematics and a PhD in computer science from New Mexico State University and has been uh, influential uh, in information extraction technology and integrating a variety of NL techniques, knowledge-based techniques with statistical and um, probabilistic techniques for a number of years before it sort of hit its real stride in the last five years. And after New Mexico, Louise went to uh, continue working on the Tipster project, which is one of the most influential uh, IE, information extraction uh, projects, funded by the government in the 90s, went to uh, Lockheed to continue leading their Tipster uh, IE effort. And then after uh, leading that effort, Tipster stopped. Louise went on to Sheffield, <coughs> Sheffield teaching and directing uh, projects and graduate students since uh, uh, 2002, 2000, right. So it was with great pleasure to introduce you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I, I thought today I would tell about um, one of the projects that we're working on, and it's it's kind of initial work, but I think some aspects of it are. Um, quite interesting, and I, I hope you'll find it so. Um, the project's motivated because a, a couple of years ago, actually, at one of the Johns Hopkins workshops, um, one of the people from the government asked me if we were able to identify disguised text. Now, it, it might be a word or a phrase, so you can certainly imagine a scenario where keyword spotting is quite good. So if phone conversations are being monitored and some criminal is wanting to um, say something not very nice, um, they avoid using certain words. You probably wouldn't hear plutonium or explode these days. Um, they would probably use some substitute word. Now, the idea is this isn't planned in advance and we agree in encoding. It's some spontaneous thing more than likely. So we haven't planned in advance. Um, Patrick Hanks pointed out to me that Cockney rhyming slang, I, I don't know if you've heard of that, but they, instead of using the word stairs, they would always say apples and pears. So it was to disguise their activities from the police, and it's quite famous. Okay. <clears throat> so what we're interested in is, can we detect when text use um, has an in inconsistent context in some sense? And you might say, well, that's going to be very hard to distinguish from novel use or exploitation in the Patrick Hank sense. It's true. It's a hard problem. But there's also disguised text at a segment or document level. And in fact, the World Trade Center bombers were said to have said, sent this message, the wedding guests have arrived at the banquet, to indicate that all the pilots were ready to go. So it's obvious why the intelligence community would look for things, and it struck us in thinking about it that, that they're looking for a kind of anomaly because anomaly means something that deviates from what's standard or normal or what's expected. Now, intelligence applications are not the only kind of anomalies we see in text. There's a lot of applications of anomaly. So for example, businesses are quite interested in <clears throat> when they see non-work related emails in work email accounts. We might be interested in spam in news groups. That's a kind of anomaly. Disguised text, as I said, translation error might show up as a kind of anomaly. Or a variation in style or authorship, plagiarism might show up. There are many, many, many applications. So with that in mind, we wrote a proposal uh, in England to the Ministry of Defense and said that we wanted <coughs> to identify text that's inconsistent with its context. And we asked to look at it at the document level, the segment level, and the word level. Now, the project was funded a little bit over a year ago, and um, 
I'm happy to say now they funded a second project in Chinese, Persian, and Arabic um, to try the techniques. But it's very initial work, and the problem's quite, quite difficult. What I'll talk about today is what we've done in this first year, which is to look at the document level and at the segment level. Okay. Now, the idea of detecting anomaly by computer automatically is certainly something that's pervasive in computer science. We, there's a lot of kinds of anomaly we want to find. So <clears throat> when network people detect a Smurf attack, where the bandwidth is just completely used up and everything's gone crazy, it's because there's anomalous traffic on the network. Um, medical problems. Doctors indicate that you have a problem because some scan is anomalous. An ECG or an EKG or some x-ray is anomalous. We'd like computers to be able to do that. I don't think we're there yet, but it's a kind of anomaly we're interested in. We know that there are lots of uh, people that look at credit card fraud by trying to detect anomalous use of a credit card. Now, again, these are areas of investigation. The reason I bring them up is, in, in trying to detect anomaly, we have to have some idea of what it means to be normal. And then we have to have some way to measure if it's not normal. But this idea of normal changes. So the way you use your credit card and the way I use my credit card are probably different. My medical scan and Ben's medical scan are probably very different. So the, the idea of normal is not fixed um, and has to be a flexible one. Okay. Now, when we talk about normal text, it seems to be an even trickier problem because if we say we're going to look for a Smurf attack on a network, well, we know that normal should be defined by <clears throat> how many packets, the arrival time of the packets on the network. We have some notion of what that is for this network. And if too many packets arrive, then we'll say, well, that's anomalous for this network. The same with credit card use. We, we have an idea that use has to do with, you know, um, how the size of the purchases you make, how often you buy things, and where you buy them. So we have some, we can get our hands on what it is that we're looking for. But text has so many dimensions that what we're looking for is a lot more elusive. So, uh, you know, what's unusual about a text? Is it the topic that's unusual? Is it the genre that's unusual? Is it the register, whether we're polite or how the education level of the person? Everybody notices policemen speak a sort of different way, don't they, in most cultures. Um, uh, is it the time period in which it was written? Is it the source? Oh, sorry, I have had so much trouble with PowerPoint yesterday, so I'm sorry. Uh, is it the source that's anomalous? So, for example, a machine translation, does that look different than a spoken, uh, than a human translation? Does spoken text look different than written text? Um, is, can we detect the native language of a speaker? If somebody is a native English speaker and suddenly someone's speaking who's non-native, we have reason to believe we can detect that. Is it the author that's anomalous? The gender of the author? Some people are interested in male-female distinctions. Is it the age of the author? And I put it there because people are quite worried about children's chat rooms if there are adults that try to disguise themselves as children talking to children. Okay. It could be the purpose of the writing that's anomalous. It could be all opinion articles and suddenly you have a factual one, or vice versa. It could be the political views. Conservative writing, suddenly you stick in a liberal one. Um, in England, they have this idea of broadsheet versus tabloid. That um, Broadsheet is like the Sunday Times or the, the London Times or Telegraph or Independent, and tabloid is like the Daily Mail or the Sun. More footballers, more naked women, D different audience. Um, is it the tone? Uh, could you detect positive versus negative? Uh, well, companies are interested in that. Um, I take a survey of how the service is at my bank, and I want a computer to automatically look at those. Most of them are positive, but I get a few negatives, or most negative, a few positives. Okay, well, there are lots of questions that come up. So, should we 
then develop different methods for each dimension of anomaly, or should our methods determine which text is not like the others? Okay. Well, we decided to go for the second. Let's see how far we can go with standard methods that don't try to say, this is for author, this is for topic, this is for genre. And <clears throat> see how our methods do in the different dimensions of anomaly. Now, what I want to talk about here is to break the talk by this, because different applications might allow training data. So if the U.S. government is looking for an email by Osama bin Laden, they may have examples of his writing. So you might have training on anomalous, you might have training on normal, or you might have neither. And I want to talk about <coughs> some experiments we've done uh, about that. So I'm going to talk about supervised, meaning we have some training data and unsupervised anomaly detection. And we've used two kinds of techniques. In each one, we've done a lot of methods. But I'll just try to give you a, a little overview, um, and you can, we can talk about it after. So <coughs> first talk about if we have some training data. And there are two cases. One is we have training for both normal and anomalous. Now, that's essentially a classification problem. And I'm sure all of you have your favorite classifiers. It's probably support vector machines. It doesn't matter what the classifier is. We tried to look at a little bit different aspect of it here. Um, so it's, it's not going to be testing with Reuters data and 500 categories and you know documents that are only two sentences long. OK. Um, and then what if we have only training data for what's normal. So this is very like speaker verification or face verification. You, you know what you want. Should you try to represent what you don't want? Should you try to represent not normal or not? So that's the kind of thing that we looked at. OK. So first, the classification problem. You have training data for normal. You have training data for anomalous. Can you find a document in a collection like this? So first example, these are all by a particular author. And we insert something by another author. Now, we can play this game to make it easy on ourselves. You know, We can say, let's take Jane Austen and let's put in Shakespeare and see if we can find that. Well, we believe we can, so <coughs> we made the problem a little bit harder. But it's essentially this. We know what normal is, and we know what anomalous is, and we're looking at each document and saying, is it normal or is it anomalous? But we have training. So <clears throat> we picked things from the Project Gutenberg, which, uh, where texts are available free because they're out of copyright. We picked eight English authors from the 19th and early 20th century, so a similar time period. We picked about a million words from each of eight authors. It's not from one novel. It's from several uh, texts of each author. I say text because one of them's a poet. Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> we kept about 2% out for testing. So we did our experiments to see how well we can do it. And that means we used about 80,000 words of training for each author. So. We wanted to look at different document sizes, because we, you can prove theorems to say that the longer the document size, the better you can classify. So this is, that's why I say it's very unlike Reuters, where sometimes you have a sentence and you have to tell if it's about silver commodities or gold commodities. This is a different kind of problem, and one I think where classification comes into its own. It, it's a problem we can do, uh, and, and do pretty well. So. That's what I'll just tell a little bit about. I used a Bayesian classifier because I did this with a mathematician many years ago. But you can pick your favorite classifier uh, how you want. The, the classifier I use is um, we, make, we take all of the words, or bigrams or trigrams, whatever you're looking at, and we partition them into three groups. One group is more common in the first population. The next one is more common in the second population. And the third one is all the rest of the words. And I talked about this last year at this conference. I won't say many details. I'll be happy to talk to you about it after. Each population has a multinomial distribution, if that means anything to you. And we use maximum likelihood to decide which category it goes to. 
if you have your favorite classifier and you think it works better than this, it will work even better than the figures I show you. Okay. But the parameters of the distribution represent the proportion of words from each of those word sets. Okay. So here's the kind of experiments we did. <coughs> so what if the piece we insert is from Lewis Carroll? So if we put Lewis Carroll into Bronte collections and we put, we repeated the experiment m many times, either from 20 times to 200, depending on the segment size. So take the Bronte collection, insert all the different Lewis Carrolls, see if we can find it and average the results. We can do it correctly 97% of the time. If we put it in Arthur Conan Doyle's, we can do it perfect. If we put it in um, T.S. Eliot's, we, oh sorry, it's George Eliot, we do 95% of the time. At any rate, you can see that it's all, they're quite decent and if you say what's the average accuracy, average those numbers, we get 93%. Now we did that for each author and all of them are distinguishable from each other. As I said, this is an e a harder problem than if we put Shakespeare into Jane Austen. So, but we have significant <coughs> pieces of writing for which to make the judgment. We have thousand word samples. Now we've t done tests with bigrams, trigrams, and single words because our feeling is that sequences of words affect writing style much more than single words. But it turns out the data is too sparse. We don't get better results with either bigrams or trigrams at this point. <coughs> if you go to smaller documents and do the same thing, we can still classify very well. Now 500 words is about 10 short paragraphs. And if we go to even smaller documents, um, we can still do very, very well. So this, this is a task that's, that's quite doable. Now, what about if there are different anomalies? So we create collections where we put many authors inside and see if we can spot them. So it's an example of supervised N-way classification. It's known to be a much harder problem. Um, I talked last time about using a tournament method to do this. That's what we used here. And uh, but the same kind of classifier, and we get very good results. If the documents are long, we get 89% before it was 96. Um, if we go to the 500 word, it was, I think, 95. 250 and 100 word documents, we don't do as well. Before we had, I think, 94%. Again, the size of the document has a great deal to do with uh, the ability to classify. Okay. We've tested other things with this two-class problem, but I, I won't go into those here, but all the results are quite reasonable. We can tell by personal emails from business ones, there's the paper in Colding this year, negative emotion emits positive. We can tell an anomalous topic, and we can tell political bias. Okay, so I'll talk now about training only on one class. So I have a collection of writing from one author and I get an unseen document and I want to know if it's from the same author. Okay. Now, and I want to talk about the two things. Do I represent the complement or not? So there's no training data for anomalous but the typical thing that's done in the speech community and speaker verification I think is if I want to have a speaker verification for Ben, then I get everyone else's speech that I can and put it in a big collection, including Ben's. I don't even try to sort him out. And I, I call that other. And then I use classification, two-way classification. We wanted to look at how, if you're going to represent other, then how do you do it? There's a massive amount of text out there. We can't use everything. So we looked at our same author set because we had it, just for some initial experiments. But this time we only allow training on one author. And we wanted to see how the classifier works when we come up with things that are not those authors. So they're neither in the 
normal, nor are they in the complement, but we pick some close things, Twain and Trollope and Mary Shelley, and we pick some farther away things, the Bible and the Quran, and we also looked at Newswire. So how do these verification systems work? Um, so we have the true author, and we want to represent the complement, and for the first set of experiments, we just took all the eight authors we had and we made that the complement. It does happen to include this one. We just didn't worry about it, just like the speaker verification does. Mm -hmm. If you give it 100 unseen Brontes, and the training is on Bronte, uh, or 700 other unseen, so that's the kind of experiment. How well do we do? In guessing the true author, we do very well, as we'd expect, because we know how to characterize that. In picking one of the authors, like Conan Doyle or um, George Eliot, the ones in the complement set, we do reasonably well. And if we do things from another collection, that's what I want to say a little bit about. What happens when we use this kind of a classifier on something that's neither in the true set nor in the complement set? And Something surprised us a little bit. If you give it close authors, Twain or Shelley or Thorpe, so it's not in this set and it's not in this set, we can still classify quite well, 85% accurate. Meaning, we want this to say not normal because it's not, it's not the true author. And it does do that right 85% of the time. If we give it some strange things, strange for these collections, it still does okay. You can give it the Bible or Quran or Shakespeare, and it still knows. Now, you have to realize we're using a probabilistic classifier. So that document is not like that, and it's not like that. But still, we do reasonably well, Sorry, and we get 83% accurate. The thing that surprised us is when we give it Newswire, so we took some modern day Newswire and fed a lot of those. These are averages over many, many experiments. We did little better than chance. So I, I've tried to talk to some of the speech people to see, you know, this is analogous to you've trained a speaker verification system for Ben. And I've used the whole rest of the room for the other. And what happens when somebody with a tracheotomy talks or a dog barks? What happens when something is so different? How does the system react? Um, and um, it may have to do with how this side is modeled. We're looking into that more. OK. So the other approach is, what if we don't model the complement, and we use a different technique? We use a hypothesis test to say, sh did this come from this population? We just ask a, a kind of statistical question like that. So we have um, a collection of normal. We don't try to represent the complement, but we try to characterize whether that document is from that distribution. And we do it by looking at a proportion of distinguishers again, but I, I won't go into detail there. Um, the point is, if we do the same experiments, we can sometimes do better. So let me explain. So the purple are the first experiments I described to you. We have uh, the regular class, and we make a complement. And the second one are, what happens when we do this hypothesis testing? Well, we don't do as well on guessing the true author or the things in the complement set, but we do better when we have the outside authors, like Shelley, Keats, and Trollope. We do better when we tested the Koran and Shakespeare. And we do perfect when we put in Newswire. Perfect meaning it knows that it's not normal. So hypothesis testing also has some benefits. How we integrate these, we're still looking at. We did one more experiment, which is what happens if you pick a general corpus? You just try to say regular English, that's going to be my other. And we give it some unseen documents. 
Well, it turns out it's not a very good thing to do, at least not how we modeled the, the complement set. So the white is how we do with the BNC. So again, you do very well on the normal population, but pretty disastrous on anything that's in the complement set. The things like Shelley and Trollope, terrible. Um, the things like Shakespeare, the Quran, pretty terrible. And again, it's very good at recognizing newswire, but probably overall, that's not how we want to go. So the conclusions for authorship, I'd say that representing the complement works reasonably well for authors. Um, it can find the ones in the complement quite well and the ones outside the complement not bad. Hypothesis testing, not representing the complement, seems to be better for the authors outside the collections and perfect for highly anomalous texts. And lastly, the correct choice of the complement is vital, that a, a general corpus performed worse than chance. So I think it's an area where we need to do more work about um, this one class problem. What, what do we look at and what's the right kind of a corpus? Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'll talk about probably the problem you would have anticipated when you hear about anomaly detection, which is we assume there's no training data. Okay. So we don't have a million words to characterize what's normal, uh, or to, and we don't have any data to characterize what's anomalous, and so we're going to think about having one document, and we're going to segment it. Now, we fix the size of the segments. We're not doing anything where we try to vary uh, how we find the segments. But we, we take different sizes. So we want to say that the one segment is anomalous um, with the rest of the document, not to a training corpus. So when we first look at a document, we have no idea. It's like a student paper. You have no idea which is normal which is anomalous, if you have any students that might do that. And the goal in this work, and it's a different kind of uh, technique, is to rank the statements, the, the segments. So I'd like to take a document and end up saying, that one's the most anomalous, the next most anomalous, the third most anomalous, like that. Now, this is not very straightforward. It's a pretty ambitious kind of anomaly detection. There's no training data. We want to allow the segments to be short, and we're kind of hampered by data sparseness. The only data we have is the rest of the document. So as you know, it's difficult to characterize segments by the distribution of their vocabulary because we don't expect segments to be very long. We took 1,000 words as the longest. Anomalous segments might be on the same topic and use the same vocabulary as the rest of the document. We know that bigrams and trigrams and skipgrams can, can somehow capture style, but with very small segments, we just can't get enough repetition to make use of those. So we want some techniques that employ some level of abstraction to, to reduce the data sparsity and focus on characterizing the style, the tone, and the lexical choice. So we've used a lot of features in this method. We've used uh, nearly 200, but I'll give you the flavor of them. So we've used some simple surface features. We've used some readability measures. We've used some things that have to do with lexical choice. We've used some part of speech features, morphological analysis. We've used some what I'll call rank features. I'll talk about those, and some emotional slant features. Okay. For the surface features, it's what you'd expect. Average sentence length, average word length, average syllables per word, percentage of long words, percentage of short words, percentage of long sentences, short sentences, percentage of punctuation, semicolons, how many questions, readability measures. I don't know if you have used these. They're an attempt to provide an indication of the reading level one needs to read a text. Um, they work well for differentiating certain texts. This is one of the readability measures. When we ran it on Romeo and Juliet, it gives a score of 84. When we ran it on Plato's Republic, 
it gives a score of 69. Uh, higher is easier. Okay. Well, there are many. We, we used many of them, and each one of them is a feature. The formulas are terrible, and I don't expect you to read that. I'll just uh, do a little summary. They all make, they're all functions of these features. So they look at average sentence length, sentence length average word length, average syllables per word, uh, words with three or more syllables, and words with six or more letters. For lexical choice, we looked at lexical density, which tries to measure how diverse the vocabulary is, and it's believed that lower density text, in other words, if you use fewer words, it's more easily understood. Oh, I'm sorry about my PowerPoint. Uh, it's um, the number of different words, it's the percentage of different words over the total number of words. Part of speech, um, we use the RASP parser, which is available um, it's developed at Sussex and at Cambridge University. Um, all the words were uh, tagged with 155 part of speech tags from the Clause 2 tag set. That's the one Jeffrey Leach used at Lancaster. Um, part of speech features, we keep track of the percentage of each part of speech. We can keep track of the ratio of adjectives to nouns, how many sentences um, begin with a coordinating conjunction. We look at part of speech trigrams and we measure the diversity of that. So we do morphological analysis on all of the texts. Um, we gather statistics about the percentage of passives that an author uses, uh, how many nominalizations the author uses. And we um, have looked at some, um, some list features. So we keep track of the most frequent part of speech trigrams. So an author tends to use, you know, determine or adjective noun over and over. That, that would be uh, in there. Uh, the most frequent part of speech bigrams and the most frequent parts of speech, most frequent articles, prepositions, conjunctions, and pronouns. We also used um, this dictionary from Harvard on affect and emotion. It's called the General Inquirer Dictionary. It has 7,800 words in, divided into 110 categories. These are some of them. But it tries to group positive words, negative words, strong words, weak words, passive words, overstated words, and so forth. Okay. So we have all these features. So what's the approach we use? Well, the majority of data determines normal. And we want to define features to characterize the text. And the differences from the majority will um, help us characterize anomalous. Now, so we have many features that attempt to characterize different aspects of the text, and we wanted to know if they are enough for anomaly detection. Well, to some extent. Is it possible to tell that a segment differs from another? We, we used three variations of a method. So I'm going to show you really one method and just do you a picture of the variations uh, of what they are. And one of them did turn out to be better. So in one method, we're going to characterize every segment. In the second one, we're going to characterize a segment and its complement. And in the third one, we're also going to do a segment and its complement, but the way we get the information about the complement uh, is different. So here's the picture. So characterizing segments. So first we segment the text, uh -huh, and then we find each of those nearly 200 features, and we make each of them um, something in a vector, a component of the vector. So a vector characterizes each segment. Mm -hmm. And so in the end, we have a matrix of features. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is found the outlier, which one has features that are strange compared to the rest. So how do we do that? So 
we look at the difference. Just uh, <laughs> we talk about similarity of vectors all the time, and you can talk then about dissimilarity. And how I measure similarity, well, that could be a lot of ways. Well, we tried a lot of ways. I'll, I'll show you. So how, how we measure the distance, leave me for one minute, but just get, uh, we tried a lot of things. So we measure the distance between things like the cosine of the angle between the vectors, what they call city block distance, Euclidean distance, and so forth. So measure the distance. So we'll have a distance between 1 and 2, 1 and 3, 1 and 4, and so forth. So in the end, we can have a distance matrix. And that says the distance between 1 and itself is 0. The distance between 1 and 2 is 0.5. 1 and 3 is 0.3, and so forth. And we want to choose the segment that's most different from the rest. And the way we determine that is just simple. We just sum these. The ones where the differences add up to be the greatest, we just say that's the outlier for for these techniques. We varied so many things that we didn't vary this. <coughs> and then we rank them by the one that had the greatest distance. Okay. So what do we use for distance? Well, we tried a, a lot of things. These are some of them. We tried the cosine similarity. But if two vectors are on top of each other, the cosine's 1. So we want to make that be a 0 distance, so we do 1 minus the the, co the cosine measure. We tried Euclidean distance, city block distance. Oh, sorry. My slides just didn't work. Um, city block distance means you just do the difference in the components, xi minus yi, and uh, 1 minus the Pearson correlation coefficient. Sorry about my slides. OK. If you want those formulas, I, I can give them to you after. Um, the second method, it's the same idea, but instead of characterizing each segment separately, um, we characterize one segment, and then we treat all the rest as a second segment, just because we get more data, and we thought maybe that would help us to sort of have the anomaly stand out. So it's just a different try. It's exactly the same method. So we look at segment one versus its complement, then <coughs> We compute the distance between the vectors. Then we look at segment 2 versus its complement. This picture is segment 3 versus its complement. So you're going to have each one. And in the end, so segment 1 versus its complement uh, has a number, segment 2, and the one that has um, the biggest distance from the complement is ranked uh, highest. In this scenario, we made good use of list features. And I guess I should tell you that in all of our experiments, this method did the best. We, we did try one more thing, which is um, represent each segment separately. Um, so you get the feature matrix, the same thing. Mm -hmm. But now, um, I want to take the vectors 2 through the end the complement of segment 1, and average those vectors. So rather than represent the complement as a separate thing, take the individual representations of the segment and see if the average of those makes a better representation of the complement. It was just a try. It actually didn't work quite as well. Well, we varied a lot of things. We had three methods. We used eight different distance measures. We um, Either we didn't normalize, in which case it's like things are weighted, or we did normalize. We tried normalizing between 0 and 1, or the deviation from the mean. Um, we tried three segment sizes. So every time we had a document, we did 216 experiments. We, we had a, a tremendous amount of data. And I'm not sure we've all analyzed all of it completely yet, but we've done some. So I'll, I'll show you. Uh, a little graphs of four things that we did. So we looked at the authors that we had, the eight authors, and we looked at 56 pairs, you know. So Bronte, insert James, can we find it by this method? 1,000 word document. 
but there's no training. This is unlike before where we had a million words of training on Bronte. We don't have anything now except the document. So it's a much, much harder problem. We looked at, if we can tell um, Newswire today, written in, in an English or American newspaper, from um, machine translated Newswire using the Google translation. We looked at, we, we wanted to pick some things that are truly might be anomalous. We don't have government clearances and we don't have real anomalous data. So we, there's something called the Anarchist Cookbook, which tells you how to make bombs and lots of bad things. Um, and we inserted pieces of that into Newswire to see if we could tell it apart. Um, and we looked at some fact versus opinion experiments. Okay. Um, so documents with an anomalous segment were created. And I'm just going to show you one chart. I don't expect you to read it. But all the charts represent an average accuracy across hundreds of documents. Um, normal's one type and anomalous is another. So we, we end up for um, getting quite hard things to analyze. This has to do with, do you require the anomaly to appear in the top three, in the top five, or the top ten in the ranking? Um, vary the document size, and this is some of the experiments. I don't want you to try to read this one. It's just that um, we've produced a lot of data. Um, we looked at things. This is an example of detecting Chinese, um, machine translated Chinese in English Newswire. So as you can see, machine translation is not, uh, not exactly uh, perfect at this point. It's very easy, even in this method, to detect translated um, Newswire versus real Newswire. So, um, we noticed this, uh, you'll hear more from Ben this afternoon at the word level, but uh, certainly the kind of translation that's on Google is, is nowhere near uh, the fluency of regular text. So this is just an example to show you that we, we looked across the, um, the different distance measures and normalizations. Um, and it turns out that doing this for all the experiments we've done, city block distance seems to do the best, and that's what we've used in most of them. Um, we allow the segment size to be set. Um, there are at least 50 segments per document. We never break in the middle of a sentence, and we experiment with three segment sizes, 100 words, that's two small paragraphs, 500 words, um, which is five short paragraphs and a thousand words, okay, which is about a page. Um, as I said, we looked at normalizing the variables and not. So um, one, we use the z-score, subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. And the other one, we just scaled them uh, into zero, one. I'll just say a little bit about this. So we took a normal population, it might be Newswire, and we took, say, machine translated Newswire, and we took a segment of this and inserted it over here. Um, and, and then we attempt to spot the anomaly. And then we take a different segment from there and insert it in the same document and do another test. So it might be we can pick out one of these segments, but we couldn't pick out another segment. So we actually do all of the segments from the anomalous population and average the results. Okay. So as I said, we looked at four different um, experiments in this way. So I'll say a little bit about the eight authors. We took the same collection that we had. Um, we used a document that's long, 50,000 words. So we have at least 50 paragraphs, and we looked at the different segment sizes. How well do we do? Well, nowhere near what we did before, but remember before we had nearly a million words of training. And now we don't have anything. We have 50,000 words if you, if you want. We have the, the document which we um, allow to be big. The point is, doing this by chance, it's, um, 
it's, it's hard to do. And um, what do we get? For 1,000 word segments, uh, we get an accuracy of 74%. If more work needs to be done, it's not bad, but um, not, not wonderful for short segments yet. Um, This is for a thousand word. What was this last one? Sorry. This was. Um, oh, I see. This is the average time that we got the document returned in the top five segments. Okay. And this one is. Um, okay. So what I showed you is essentially in the top five for a thousand word documents, we did the best. So what if we look at how many times do we get it in the top three? not as often, how many times do we get it in the top 10, and how many times do we get it in the top 20. So for across all of the methods, we do pretty good. If an analyst wants to find a document that's suspicious in a collection, and we can produce the result in the top 20, I think they'll be quite happy if the collection's big. But we don't have a very big collection here. We, I, I, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip this. You can look across authors and see which ones are easiest to detect. I'll just skip to a few slides. So we looked at some fact versus opinion things. Um, there, I guess I should, the opinions were editorials we took from these newspapers. We, it didn't have much. It was 28,000 words, but we just inserted segments. So we had at least 28 segments to insert. Um, the, the normal text we had from the GigaWord, which is 1.5 billion words, so we have a lot of data we could take from. And we did it for each news source because uh, the writing may be uh, different. Um, this is a success story, and it's certainly one where you can see Method 2 did a lot better. So we can find the um, opinion article in the midst of fact. Um, quite well in the top three, uh, better in the top five, top ten, and top twenty. Method two clearly outperformed the other m methods. This is with the city block distance. Um, the News versus Anarchist Cookbook, again, very good in the top twenty. And again, you can see Method two did, did do very well. Um, if we look at News versus Chinese translated news. So the, the translation was of Xinhua newspaper. So it was Chinese news, and we translated it. Um, it's our real success. So lots of work has to be done in machine translation. It's easily distinguishable from, uh, from native writing. Um, OK, if you look at all the anomaly tasks, we did better in some than another. But if you look at all of them with method two, with city block distance, and how often did we find it in the top five, um, you can see that we did the best on the machine translation and um, somewhat worse in the other tasks. Um, segment size, we know this always. Met uh, accuracy improves with longer segments, and I'm sure you're dying for me to stop. Uh, method two produced the best overall results. The city block method uh, produced the best rankings, and standardization actually varied depending on what we were looking at. Um, we did some analysis of which features contributed to which experiment. I'll talk to you about it after if you would like to know that. Some th things are looking like they're, they're the right thing. In fact versus opinion, for example, uh, the, the our words, the things that say we or us, uh, stood out as being prevalent. Um, conclusions. Well, I would say the first experiments where you have training on both material is really not new. It's not new work, but it's maybe a different way to look at some old work. Um, training, when we only have normal, it's reasonably successful. Still more work needs to be done on how to represent the complement and when should it be represented. <coughs> We're now working on um, the model that we put on the complement, uh, making it a Dirichlet model instead of 
uh, the simple multinomial we used. Um, what happens when you have no training data? Well, I think the results are pretty promising. The problem's hard. I should say that most of the work on supervised anomaly detection is due to Ben Allison, who's here, and uh, most of the work on unsupervised is due to David Guthrie, who's in Sheffield. Um, the future, well, we want to spend the next year looking at the word and phrase level techniques, I hope with Patrick Hanks' help, uh, because uh, he, he's done a lot to look at word exploitations, and it's very close to that. Um, we want to look at modeling the complement a different way, and uh, we start to work on applying these techniques. We've already applied them in Chinese, and they, they work um, about the same as in English. Um, and we're working on Chinese and Arabic, and um, I thank you very much for listening. We, we didn't do anything, except that we didn't break sentences. Okay, but, uh, so you, you didn't... Uh, so the flow, you, you were absolutely right. The, the flow may be broken, so when we look at a segment versus its... But when we look at a segment versus its complement, in that method two, it might be why method two works, we, then, then that cohesion's put back, isn't it? <coughs> So when we take a document, we just really split it. We don't remove anything. We split it somewhere and insert. Okay. Or, or we split. Right. So, then, so, so we got a uh, sequence and, and the snippet inserted. That's and right. The sequence is broken. Exactly. So, and, and you, didn't, you, you didn't make use of this, that uh, uh, the snippet is, is different. Uh, I think, I'm not sure, but I think uh, the next segment is somehow more um, more similar to the previous segment. That's, that's true. We then. did not. I mean, I, I would say that we, oh, where did I, where is this? Can't read it. Is it this? No, no your presentation is down in the middle of the box. Oh, uh, I would say that when we use the second method, Um, when we use this method of difference from the complement, in some sense the cohesion is put back together because we're measuring, um, we're characterizing the red bit and then we're characterizing the blue bit which is exactly the original document without anything inserted. So one of these representations is right, the rest aren't. I mean, yeah, I understand. I mean, we're, we're not doing anything that's, that's semantic, that's taking into account meaning, and certainly lots of work needs to be done on that. It's still trying to use surface techniques to, to see if we can get any gain at all. I, I but but is, so it's different when, when you would take, for example, this normal text and put it in a random order. So it would be different. But our techniques are not so sensitive. I mean, you're, you're right, and it should be considered, but we haven't done anything to take into account that ordering. Really, we break everything up, more or less. Yeah. I, I, I suppose you don't have at your disposal a real disguise text. We don't. We begged. Because we thought they they'd give, give us. Because uh, the defense department wouldn't give it to you. Yeah, it's Ministry of Defense. It's, well, it's English, but yeah, we thought they would give us. Maybe not um, protected data, but we thought they might give us things that, that were close to their problem. I mean, we can imagine their problem, but it's all for movies or, you know, we don't, we don't really know their problem. And so um, we hoped that they would supply us some, maybe not real data, but maybe they could pick some other data. But they say, no, 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 you, you pick all the collections, you can do whatever you want with this. It's, I, I don't know, I mean, I think it's a problem that uh, 
there's funding for and, and that it's worth in other languages. I'd be happy to collaborate with any of you if you get your own governments to, to do something in conjunction and use this as a, a sort of stepping stone. I, I think it's, it's a problem that, uh, that a, a lot of things in computer science can be seen as anomaly. Um, have you measured, um, as a sort of baseline, how far uh, texts vary within themselves? I mean, the, the certain parts of a, a, a single author's work can, might be regarded as, regarded as anomalous in, in relation to the others. So very good what was the degree of variation? Yeah, very good question. We'll have very, very good. Have you done that? No, no, no. We did, <laughs> did, we did do some things, though, where we did pretty much what you said, ran it without inserting anything, and it was quite reassuring to see that things like lists and recipes in the middle of the document, things like that, came up as the anomalous thing. So. Yeah. Uh, music of high order and drum is pretty uh, standard in uh, all the detection, and uh, the view that uh, Google offers uh, their pentagram uh, the question is whether well, have you considered uh, using uh, higher order uh, engrams? Uh, and I don't believe that work. I, I, I don't believe it. I think, um, I, I know that's terrible, but I think this, the data is too sparse. I mean, it's possible that you can find one phrase that an author uses over and over. And I think humanities people are, are willing to look at things quite carefully by hand. But for computer, for repetition, we don't see it. I mean, we, we do much worse in these experiments. <coughs> well, the first experiments with the training on both populations, we've tried with bigrams and trigrams, which are a very small approximation of context. And we do worse. Um, we just don't see enough repetition. I, if you go to Ben's talk tonight, um, it's about data sparsity. It's about how much you miss when you collect even trigrams and when you get to four grams and five grams. It, it's just, it's not that that method's bad, but it's just what your goal is. If it's to do something completely automatically, I don't think at this point we get enough repetition with the kind of data that we're seeing. But you could say, you mean if like one phrase stands out? It, uh, it's on the direction uh, you have uh, on the last slide that phrase detection may identify uh, the, the author very. Um, on the last slide, I meant can we identify a disguised phrase? So when a cockney says apples and pears, they say it in a funny way. They say, I'm going up the apples and pears. It, it doesn't make sense. So we want to know, can we, can we find phrases like that? I, I, would li I mean, it's true that longer phrases should be revealing, but, but the data we have so far, uh, um, we just don't see enough repetition. I, that's my belief. Yes. Uh, do you think that your methods are yeah. oh, sorry? <laughs> sorry okay, sorry. Uh, but, uh, I can just, I would like to point out that at Masaryk University, uh, we have a system that checks plagiarism. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And this is based on pentagrams. I believe that. And I will show you, or I can show you later, how it works. And, uh, it, well, for example, it checks no, no. students' works and it works reasonably. Uh, you're right. I, I know this. I mean, and uh, there's a copycat system that does the same thing. Yeah. It's true that very few people in the world reuse the same five or six word sequence. That's true. But that, can we assume then that every author reuses a five or six word sequence? I, I think that a different question was being asked there. I, I don't think that's true. What we find is there's not enough repetition in long grams if you look at a given author's work. Certainly for students, right? You read all the time, you see something, it just, uh, just rings a bell. I've seen that before. And you look on Google and you can find usually the students. Yes. Well, uh, uh, I think your approach is based, based on statistical methods. 
and uh, my assumption is that your status means is quite stable. By my opinion, the real life uh, in the real life is quite normal that we have a lot of unique situation, and then we use unique words and the unique uh, sentences. Then, if you are checking uh, these writers, uh, if you have a wait uh, on these uh, books, then I think the right uh, approach is to base a database on one book, then take sentence from another book and check <coughs> if you can detect that this is the same writer, because it is new situation as it is in real life. Then, for example, I never. I just once used in my life also the word wedding, and I invite people As for the wedding then. Uh, in, in that time, it is a normal situation. Absolutely. Yeah, but mm -hmm. it's quite normal that people are sending these uh, you, you're right. letters. And we, we have done some experiments on training on one author and then test uh, on one book and then testing on other, well, I, I don't know. We've, we've done tests where we trained on some books and tested on yet another book. And we've done the better, <coughs> Federalist Papers and we've done the Shakespeare that's contested. And uh, I mean, we, we have. Lot, lot of we need a consistent way. Yeah, we, we haven't done it in a consistent way across authors. You're absolutely right. I, I agree. <coughs> we have time for one more question. Is there something? Yes. And do you think that your methods and features are applicable also to spoken language, or because you just applied it to a written language, uh, do you think that will change the result? Um, we, the only experiments I've done with transcriptions of spoken texts um, were the ones for a native speaker. Could we detect a native German speaker versus a native French speaker versus a native Spanish speaker? And we can do that uh, about 80% of the time. I mean, for some distinctions, we can do more. But um, so I think, yes, I think some of the techniques will apply to transcriptions. So if, if ASR gets good, then I think it will apply to transcriptions of spoken text, we, we hope. And I think that's what the intelligence people must be thinking, because if it's really if they're really interested in written text, why wouldn't they encode it or, I mean, or, or plan in advance, right? I mean, it, I think this kind of thing <coughs> can only be interesting to them because it's a kind of spontaneous, you know, I, I want to talk to a fellow criminal and I haven't planned in advance that I'm going to say ice cream instead of bomb. But I can't change the whole metaphor or my criminal friend won't understand me, so I, I can just change a word and say the ice cream is going to explode. I can't probably say the ice cream is going to melt. They, they won't know anything. Mm -hmm. Let's thank Louise again.